proceed with please note also that this call is being recorded uh, to allow for uh, further learning and for people who could not uh, join to um, benefit from this uh, webinar so um, please um, take note that it is uh, recorded Okay, so again, good afternoon, good evening, uh, um, everyone, depending on where you are uh, in the world, it could be also good morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, our webinar, which is organized by the Advocacy Working Group of the uh, Global Protection uh, Cluster. Some housekeeping points before we start. For the interpretation, please, press the button uh, in your uh, list or you will have a globe button where you can choose French, Spanish or Ukrainian in case you have not uh, um, um, uh, been able to do that. I will just very quickly in both languages pour l'interprétation, veuillez appuyer sur le bouton globe où vous pouvez choisir le français, l'espagnol ou l'ukrainien. Uh, para la interpretación, uh, puse el botón del globo terráqueo donde podrá elegir entre francés, español o ucraniano. Um, so um, I hope this works. Please, if you have any challenges with the interpretation, put a message in the chat box and hopefully we will be able to assist you in this um, uh, regard. Uh, try to keep yourself muted as mentioned during the presentations to avoid background noise. If you feel comfortable to put on your cameras, we would be delighted to see you as well as uh, hearing you. Uh, you can post your questions and comments in the chat box and you will have the chance to interact directly with our panelists in the Q&A session that will follow the presentations. So today's webinar covers a topic that is receiving increased interest within the humanitarian sector, most notably because of the uh, impact of uh, misinformation, disinformation, and uh, hate speech, which they have on uh, protection of civilians in conflict uh, settings. So. Uh, and, and because the spread of this misinformation and this information is becoming so fast as a result of social media and the online um, channels. The Global Protection Clusters Protection Analysis, so if you look at the protection analysis of the Global Protection Cluster where different protection risks are analyzed, you would see that on disinformation and misinformation, 60% of the countries where there is a protection analysis, this means like 15 out of 25 countries where these protection risks are monitored, 60% display medium to high levels of disinformation and denial of access to information. Disinformation in uh, armed uh, conflict can expose civilians to multiple, um, multiple uh, protection uh, threats, uh, including exposure to violence, targeting of specific groups, obstruction of access to basic services, mental suffering, and of course, among others. Um, few days ago, I was watching the news on TV and I heard an intervention of a member of the French National Assembly and he was speaking about Gaza. He quoted, the first casualty of war is truth. And with the speakers uh, who are participating today in this webinar, we had started preparing for the webinar before the 7th of October and the war in Gaza. And today, in light of the current context, we find the topic to be very pertinent. And we are hoping that while the research that will be presented is focused on Ukraine, and while there is a lot of work to be done on the Ukrainian context, we are hoping that also the different interventions Interventions and the tools that will be shared and the discussions will allow for um, cross-learning and broader reflections um, on the topic. And to tell us more about this, we are pleased uh, today to be 
um, joined by uh, colleagues who have a lot to say about the topic. First, we will uh, hear from Ms. Joelle Riz, the Digital Threats Advisor of the International Committee of the Red Cross based in Geneva. And then uh, the main uh, findings of uh, the, the Center for Civilians in Conflict uh, uh, Research in Ukraine, Mrs. Uh, Lauren Spink, she's the senior um, she's the senior research advisor for Civic, and she will be uh, telling us more about this. And finally, Mrs. Uh, Leah Krivchenia, senior humanitarian program manager for Internews, who will tell us more about some of the tools uh, and the toolkits that were produced by Internews to allow <laughs> or support with practical uh, measures in, in, in this uh, regard. Our panelists will be discussing the topic of misinformation and disinformation in conflict settings and their impact on civilian protection, highlighting the different initiatives within their organizations, including um, studies and toolkits. And um, to be very honest, I'm very excited that uh, some of these toolkits will be presented for the first time today in um, this uh, webinar. Um, without further ado, I want to turn to our first speaker, uh, Joel from the ICRC. Uh, Joel, first, thank you very much for joining us um, today. And we are very uh, pleased to have you with us and to hear from your perspective and the perspective of the ICRC. But also, uh, it's very interesting to hear from your perspective because you focus on um, digital uh, threats. So we see that the ICRC has produced a lot of resources and material uh, and facilitated discussions and analyses around uh, the topic of disinformation and uh, misinformation. If I may ask you, Joel, why has the topic gained so much attention and traction over the past few years? And uh, what is it that uh, you would say are the main associated risks of protection uh, or risks associated uh, with the um, topic in terms of protection of uh, civilians? Thank you, and thanks for having me. Apologies, uh, this was all organized last minute, so I won't exactly have a presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll speak maybe for a few minutes and happy to answer questions later. Um, can you hear me well? Because earlier I couldn't use my microphone on an earlier call. Can you yeah, hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so this topic actually has been um, on our mind and has been a concern for us at the ICRC for quite some time now, it's even more than five, six years now. Um, and we, when we first started looking at it, we were thinking about it uh, from um, the, the perspective of means and methods of warfare and hybrid warfare, and also from the perspective of can information be weaponized or not? Is that even a legal, um, a, a legal interpretation or legal terminology that can be used? Uh, but we quickly realized that the, the issue is far more complex than this, and it, it's touching really on the lives of everybody that is affected by conflict because in for the, the, everybody is consuming information and the um, and the information ecosystem in, con in conflict is important for more than just access to information itself. It's really important for people's decision-making for their safety and for their dignity. And for that, we wanted to go more in details on uh, what that really means. And one way that we look at it today is the information dimension of conflict. Um, and uh, we decided that instead of talking about whether an information is true or false, fabricated or not, we really wanted to focus on an umbrella term. And that's where we came to misinformation, disinformation and hate speech. Now, when we say misinformation, disinformation and hate speech, we don't only mean M and D and H. We actually use that as an umbrella term to talk about different information disorders in situations of conflict that are potentially harmful to uh, civilians affected by conflict. So that could also be malinformation. So information that is actually uh, accurate, it's not fabricated, but the way it is, sure, it is shared, the, 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 the timing in which it is shared may actually uh, um, have the intention to cause, uh, for example, unrest or cause violent reactions or incite certain uh, harmful behavior. 
Um, so in our mind, it's really the harm that may emanate or the humanitarian consequences that uh, result after the spread of certain information. And as we look at MDNH or as we look at MDH as a phenomena, really, uh, it's important to keep in mind that this is not new. We've 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 all been with it's as old as conflict existed, whether in the form of propaganda. It's, it's as old as communities existed, really. It's, it's rumors, for example, is something we've all dealt with in every type of uh, uh, field uh, work that we've done, right? Um, so what I would keep in mind here is the, the way that this phenomena has been shaped in the past, um, I would say, 10 or, uh, 10 or more years is through the digitalization of the information ecosystem and through the, uh, and and and, and uh, of uh, digital platforms, um, including but not only uh, social media platforms, and what that has done is that it has become much easier um, to to spread harmful information. Uh, it can it's easier also because it can be uh, largely anonymous for the user. Um, and also because the scale and the speed at which it spreads has been altered by the use of uh, digital technologies. And we see that in situations of conflict, it's not only uh, the users and it's not only um, uh, individuals that are spreading uh, harmful information. In fact, there's in a way uh, states and uh, state affiliated groups uh, or even non-state actors and groups affiliated with those uh, are also leveraging the um, the uh, digital space through uh, whether it's through social media platforms or whether through messaging or other type of communication systems, digitalized communication systems, leveraging leveraging that to achieve an information advantage in uh, a given conflict situation, to achieve a certain influence uh, over the beliefs or over uh, the behavior of uh, either population or adversary. Uh, groups as well. Um, so for us, it's no longer about whether information is mis or disinformation or malinformation. For us, it's this is about how conflict is impacting people. It's about means of methods of warfare. It's, it is about respect to law and it is about protection. It is about protection because it's impacting people's decision making. Uh, it's impacting people's situational awareness. We see that uh, an information space is being used to uh, spread disinformation about people's safety, about airstrikes, about uh, evacuation routes, about safety of roads, checkpoints, etc. cetera. Uh, we also see that uh, uh, the information space is used to spread fear among people, causing potentially eviction or displacement. Um, it is also impacting their ability to make decisions in a way that impacts their dignity. When you are consuming information that is mostly fabricated, manipulated, um, or altered in a way to influence your behavior and your beliefs, I would even argue that, is that isn't that also impacting your autonomy as an individual or a community to make these decisions and therefore your dignity. And of course, also we see, and, and that is one of the, the ugliest forms and of, of, uh, in which uh, MDH can cause harm, is the incitement of violence against individuals or against communities or groups. Um, so beyond hate speech, uh, the dehumanization of individuals and of communities, but also uh, the, the clear sometimes incitement of violence or incitement of uh, generally gen uh, violations of international humanitarian law. Um, and also maybe one specific aspect that is very uh, particular to in situations of conflict, and that is um, the behavior in the information space that uh, impact the dignity um, of protected persons. And in this particular case, for example, the prisoners of war uh, and exposing them to public curiosity or exposing uh, their identity and their pictures or the way that they are being treated uh, in the public domain. Um, there's of course many other different forms, but. I think this is the umbrella of the different type of concerns that, that uh, and the trends that we observe are as a result of uh, misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech. And maybe one uh, very overarching trend that we also see is is a bit of a mix of all of the the, the ones I've already mentioned. But in a way, this um, this quick escalation of narratives around uh, and that are largely dehumanizing for. Uh, the adversary or dehumanizing for people of certain background or coming from certain areas or speaking certain languages just because um, or, or of different religions. Um, 
it, it generally really undermines the uh, the capacity of uh, um, humanitarian uh, actors to conduct to do their job to conduct dialogue around humanitarian principles, um, and it makes it really harder. Uh, uh, to uh, to discuss, for example, human rights or, or uh, international humanitarian law with certain actors. Um, the last point I'll make is uh, about humanitarian action in at large uh, and the way that uh, the spread of um, misinformation and disinformation, uh, especially when it is in a coordinated or an organized way, uh, um, either about a specific organization or about the, de the very delivery of aid, about the humanitarian action itself, or the very role of a humanitarian organization, say, in relation to evacuations, for example, or in, in relation to delivering aid to hospitals or medical facilities. Um, so when, when this happens, then the information is not only becomes a security risk to humanitarian uh, workers themselves, but also to the very, human, this, the very humanitarian space and the ability of uh, a humanitarian actor to fulfill their, uh, their mandate. Um, I can say a bit more maybe later, depending on the time and the space of how we're handling, how we're thinking around MDH, how we're structuring ourselves and, and, and uh, our approach a little bit. Uh, to that, but I'll stop here to make space for the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. And uh, you know, as you speak, I think too many examples are coming to everyone's uh, uh, minds uh, uh, given the current um, um, context. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Joel. And I think the other speakers will definitely build on uh, what you have just presented. Um, um, and uh, now I want to turn to our colleagues from uh, Civic. Uh, so we have uh, Alex uh, Griff with us, who is the country director of Civic in Ukraine, and uh, um, uh, Lauren Spink, who is the um, senior um, research advisor for Civic. And both of them will be telling us more about the research that uh, Alex, Lauren, and their teams in Ukraine have uh, worked on uh, to highlight uh, disinformation and, in, and misinformation and link it to the, uh, or showcase the impact on uh, protection of uh, civilians. Alex and uh, Lauren, first, thank you very much for choosing this platform to present the findings of uh, your uh, uh, research. So if you can tell us more about those uh, findings and what are the main recommendations that um, uh, you would put forward based on those uh, findings. Over to you, um, Alex and uh, Lauren, and thanks again. Thanks so much for hosting us, Yasmin, um, and uh, to everyone who's joining the call, thanks for your interest in, in civics research. Uh, really happy to have the chance to, to exchange with you today. Uh, I will start just by uh, giving some background on what we actually looked at with the research uh, and how it was done quickly. Uh, we looked at three issues in the research, and that is first, how trust in and use of different information sources uh, was changing uh, after the Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, how that changed. Second, how disinformation targeted at Ukrainian civilians uh, affected them, affected their protection, uh, their decision-making. And third, how different information ecosystem actors responded to that disinformation threat uh, and, and what those responses looked like. Our methodology, uh, we had a survey uh, of Ukrainian civilians in different areas across the country. We did uh, qualitative interviews with a variety of subject matter experts in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. And we also worked with a partner to do analysis of messages being shared on Telegram in specific locations at high risk times to see what types of uh, narratives were being shared. Moving to uh, that first research question around uh, Ukrainian information practices and the ecosystem and how it was changing uh, in the, the days and weeks after the of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, 
the first thing we noticed very clearly uh, was a large increase in people's consumption of information, which I'm sure is not surprising. Uh, but if you see here from our survey responders, uh, you know, before the, the full scale invasion, most people were watching a few hours of television a day or online a few hours a, a day. And then um, in the days and weeks after the invasion, you see that jump significantly with uh, with many people spending more than six hours a day on multiple platforms. Um, and, uh, and this is also across different regions of the country and not only in frontline areas. So indirectly speaking with people in frontline areas, many said they spent every waking moment checking information platforms, um, every waking moment that wasn't dedicated to fulfilling other critical uh, critical survival needs. And looking at a shifting use of platforms and trust in platforms, uh, there's, you know, you can see this jump uh, from before the full scale invasion, uh, reliance primarily on television for information about the political situation and the security situation in the country, very clearly to, uh, to a growing, uh, a very rapidly growing reliance on social media platforms, uh, Telegram in particular. Uh, but this uh, this does um, this does vary by age. I think that's um, something to to be for protection actors, especially to be aware of. Um, you know, we we actually only saw, for example, in um, in the weeks after the invasion. The, the average person might be spending, you know, the average um, participant or 30.7% of, of across the people we we surveyed um, were using Telegram as a primary source, but only 4.8% of people over 60 years of age were actually using Telegram. Um, and then, and, 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 and in response to why, um, you know, you, this is about speed, relative mobility of this platform, particularly as people are, um, you know, fleeing their homes to shelters, um, they're able to bring their phones, they're able to access Telegram, which is designed for mobile phones in shelters while on the move, um, and sometimes even as other forms of communication are being cut off. Um, and and it's not just use of information platforms, but also growing trust in Telegram. Uh, and and so you know if what this means for the for civilian protection, if you think about that, is uh, is that Telegram is important to civilians as a critical source of information, a timely source of information when other sources are becoming less reliable uh, so that they can make a decision about whether they not need to shelter uh, so that they can understand, uh, so that they can get information about conflict developments. But at the same time, uh, we also see uh, an increase in disinformation being shared on social media platforms, including Telegram, and a mismatch between growing civilian trust in the platform and uh, the evaluation of most experts that Telegram is one of the least safe and regulated platforms uh, to, be, to be accessing information on. I'll move now to that second research question uh, on, the, um, on the impact of disinformation on civilians and, uh, and how it affected their protection. So we, First, to mention uh, the certain tactics and the impact of those tactics, uh, we saw that Russian affiliated actors uh, were launching disinformation in specific geographic areas at a very local level and with timing that coincided with Russian military offensives. Uh, civilians were often the main target of this information, not the military. And with this very local lev level, information or misinformation and disinformation uh a lot of uh a lot of the people we spoke with 
stressed that it was harder to identify this type of disinformation, these types of narratives at a local level than more strategic and national level narratives, which could be uh, picked up on quickly and um, and uh, proven to be false much more quickly. And also um, that they could identify as disinformation more clearly uh, rather than uh, not being sure if it was mis or disinformation. The harmful narratives that we we saw with our research. Uh, so first, um, we saw narratives obscuring frontline developments and sowing panic among civilians. So this, for example, uh, included uh, information about uh, which areas of the country were under control by Russia versus under control by Ukraine. Uh, information trying to convince communities that there were spies among them and they should be searching for these spies in different ways um, or about impending attacks that um, that were planned or didn't materialize. Um, and then we also saw something that Joelle was speaking about um, around manipulating population movements. So uh, what this looked like was uh, false information about the existence of evacuation of supported uh, evacuation routes, the safety, uh, timing, and location of evacuation routes, uh, as well as efforts uh, before uh, Ukrainian offensives were uh, were likely to recapture territory occupied by Russia, uh, an effort to get the population to uh, move to Russia, uh, a lot of fear and disinformation being spread to try and influence that movement. Uh, and what this, uh, in particular, this some of these efforts to manipulate population movements looked like in uh, you know on Telegram and in specific locations, we have a few case studies in the report uh, one I'll highlight first uh, was, for example, this uh, this pro-Russian news outlet, Anna News, claiming uh, that the Ukrainian military was firing on, injuring, and turning back civilians on certain evacuation routes at a critical time where civilians uh, had to make decisions about whether to flee Mariupol uh, uh, as 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 Russia and Russia was advancing to occupy. Uh, we didn't see any credible or corroborating evidence for uh, this claim by Anna News. And a similar case study uh, looking uh, actually at uh, the area around Kharkiv, um, uh, posts from one account uh, that we reviewed claiming that Ukraine, the Ukrainian armed forces were firing on civilians trying to evacuate also advising against civilians taking very specific routes and recommending other routes. Um, and if you look at the, the link between harm there, it's not always very clear, but in this case, we did see that the route recommended uh, by this individual was um, bombed, hit with artillery, Russian artillery, the same day that uh, the route was recommended. And there's a few more case studies in, in the report. Uh, a, a third area where we saw harmful narratives um, were in efforts to undermine social cohesion. Uh, so this is not new in Ukraine, um, but we did see it continuing um, after the full-scale invasion. Uh, and, um, and that included you know, efforts to create tensions between displaced persons and host communities within Ukraine, um, efforts to, to drive tensions between primarily Russian language speakers in the country and primarily Ukrainian speakers in the country. Uh, those were kind of the highlighting the ongoing concerns that people flagged. Um, there was also a concern uh, that in the future that uh, this same type of disinformation and narratives would be used were very likely to be used to drive tensions between people who stayed in occupied areas of Ukraine and those who uh, who evacuated. We looked for, uh, this is another issue that Joelle raised um, really poignantly in her introduction. Uh, we also, is, is about uh, disinformation about life-saving services. So we also looked for, for that. Um, we didn't see 
you know, as distinct a pattern or or as much of this as as we know has happened in other conflicts like Syria. Um, but we did see uh, a few narratives that appeared um, to be designed to undermine Ukrainian civilian trust in the government and military that could have an impact on people uh, not seeking access to life-saving services that was available. So for example, saying that hospitals were closed, um, that uh, ambulances weren't available for people in certain areas when they were available. Uh, and um, and spreading rumors about water being contaminated, for example. Uh, and then we asked some questions about the impact on mental health. It's obviously difficult to draw that that direct link between disinformation and mental health, but among the Ukrainians we spoke with, their own self-assessment was that it was contributing to uh, to a real uh, shift in mental health. Uh, that it did have an impact on mental health and they described feelings of it, it uh, disinformation, uh, creating feelings of anger, vulnerability, anxiety, panic, despair uh, were kind of the, the primary issues or primary sentiments that people raised. Uh, then the third kind of research question we looked at on response of actors in the information ecosystem or protection actors, our main takeaway is, uh, uh, some of them are listed here, so that proactive and frequent communication from the Ukrainian government, uh, from officials, uh, civilian officials, military officials at the local and national levels were very important for civilians. Um, the trust in these official sources was very high. Use of these official sources was very high to parse through disinformation. Um, and that proactivity uh, was, was really important to civilians uh, being able to navigate a, a very uh, confusing information space. There was also coordination between government and civil society that was critical in identifying and, and preventing the spread of disinformation, as well as uh, some, some efforts to bring together social media platforms with civil society and government to identify and, um, and combat this dynamic. Um, but we also saw that government and civil society were least able to identify and address disinformation at a uh, at that local level. And this is just the type of disinformation that civic saw was most harmful to civilians or had the most protection, most uh, most immediate protection concerns for civilians was this local level, uh, these local level narratives, for example, around evacuation. Uh, and we also saw the response of social media companies often delayed and not very well contextualized. And even though we didn't see kind of the, the distinct patterns uh, and levels of, of uh, disinformation around humanitarian response uh, that has been seen in some other conflicts, uh, we did see that civilian views of humanitarian organizations were influenced uh, or appear to, be, appear to have been influenced in some cases by mis- and disinformation. Uh, I think the primary factor and when we asked about trust was their direct experience of services with humanitarians, but then we saw examples as well of mis- and disinformation uh, detracting from that trust. And so if you think about the recommendations emerging from this, there are many in the report. There are some to humanitarians working on protection um, to be thinking about how this analysis is incorporated into their protection monitoring mechanisms, their um, their humanitarian response plans, their staffing, their training of staffing, um, their training of staff, and um, and many recommendations to uh, to Ukrainian authorities, uh, including that there be a real awareness and planning around how disinformation uh, is likely to impact civilians. And response to that, not only paying attention to and focusing on disinformation, uh, the, the way disinformation affects their ability to fight, wage, and win war, but also their ability to protect civilians. I think I'm probably um, beyond my time or at my time, so I'll pause there. And um, there's, I think, a lot more we could we could discuss um, later if, if, if there's time. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Um, Alex, uh, do you want to add something? Thank you. I think I'll uh, I'll let uh, Leah speak first, and then I'll come in after.
after we had the Q&A to talk a little bit more about the, the many actions that Ukrainian society has always taken to address um, the issues that Lauren spoke of um, and then to show kind of like the gaps that remain today. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, Leah from Internews, over to you. Um, again, I think uh, the, the excitement is uh, throughout this uh, presentation because uh, Leah also will be presenting to us a toolkit uh, that was just launched by Internews and that is titled Information and Risks, a Protection Approach to Information Ecosystems. Um, so, Leah, if you can tell us more about the toolkit Toolkit, but also the different toolkits that you have uh, within Internews and that um, the participants can uh, uh, benefit uh, from in their uh, daily work to address disinformation and misinformation. Over to you, Lia. Great. Thanks, Yasmin. Um, and hello, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things that we have, as at Internews have been working on related to our work on misinformation and disinformation, and then also related to protection. So um, first, just looking at these sort of questions of misinformation analysis and rumor tracking. These are activities that Internews has been doing in crisis for many years, and I want to highlight a couple areas that I think really echo um, what came out of this super interesting um, research that Civic has done. So one is just the sort of um, really basic statement that that we we find that misinformation is really about trust. And and over the years that we've been working on this, we've recently um, sort of put forth our this trust framework that you can see on the screen, um, um, and that is to help us on the analysis side for one, right? So understanding what makes narratives that might be mis or disinformation trusted by communities. This is not a sort of normative framework. It doesn't mean that the information is quote unquote good or accurate or relevant, but what are the components that create trust? And therefore, why are what, what are some of the reasons why these narratives can take root and cause harm, as I think we've really seen clearly from um, the last presentation. So this is one of the tools that we use in our sort of ongoing qualitative analysis. Um, of rumors and mis and disinformation. One other point that I think came through really clearly, it, it is qualitative analysis, right? It's sense making. Um, it needs to be done as close as possible to the community level. I think it was a really interesting finding around those really hyper local disinformation narratives being the most harmful. And that makes a lot of sense, I think, in a protection context where we know that protection risks are quite localized as well. Um, also speaks to certainly the role of civil society in, in leading and, and, and participating in this kind of analysis. And then the other point that I'll make about, about trust is I think that using this, this way of thinking about trust is also then how we can think about responding to misinformation and disinformation. And so our focus on that in, in the work that Internews does is, is less around sort of that fact checking or sort of correcting necessarily, but creating alternative um platforms and channels and information providers creating or supporting existing ones that can provide trusted information. And what are those aspects that create that trusted information? Is it locally relevant? Is it culturally appropriate? Is it fast? Is it responding to the very specific questions and needs and concerns that people have? And so this framework helps us both on the analytical side to understand that misinformation and then also when we're sort of designing responses to help us understand how to most appropriately design those responses and 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 make sure that the the information that we think people need is also trusted. So I'm going to shift also quickly then to to talk about some other work that we've been doing really bringing in this question of protection risk. And so um we have been working on a, a BHA funded project recently that have, we've just released these guidelines. I'm really excited to be able to, to share them with you all. Um, it covers a lot of things. There's a, a whole section on safe and accountable programming. There's a whole section on sort of a community safety guide for local media. Today, I'm going to talk about this piece around protection analysis of the information ecosystem, which is really in line with the work that Civic has been doing. Um, so one of the things that we like to say, it's very cheesy, if you'll forgive me, is that information saves lives and information can also be a threat to life, right? So we're interested in information partly from the perspective of it being a way to contribute to protection outcomes. It is a way that we can support the reduction of protection risk, but it can also be a part of the threats that, that we see against civilians. And so looking at it in both of those ways is really important. 
So some of the work that we've done on this, this protection analysis of the information ecosystem has been about identifying some of those risks that Yasmin mentioned earlier. So we sort of talk about them around information related protection risks. And so we're looking at on the one hand, the denial of access to information. And on the other hand, disinformation, misinformation and rumors, which we similarly, I think to the way Joelle talked about it um, at, at the ICRC, we tend to, to group together. Um, so on the one hand, interested in denial of access of information, um, it's a form of deliberate deprivation that can take many forms, um, inhibiting people's ability to create, share, seek, and obtain information. And this is, you know, it's a whole range of things. We can see the elimination of, of communications infrastructure, internet shutdowns, um, intimidation, keeping people from speaking of things, very specific denial of access to information around services, people in one community maybe don't get that information. There's a whole range of things. On the other hand, we see this set of disinformation, misinformation, and rumors, um, false information that is spread either intentionally or unintentionally um, that, can, that can lead to significant harm. One of the things that came out really clearly in the research that we did in, in developing this framework is that these, these risks are very interlinked um, and, and can create a cycle between themselves um, and so need to be sort of looked at in that way. So on the one hand, the denial of access to information makes it very difficult for people to to verify information right to, to recognize if the information that they're receiving is accurate or if it is mis or disinformation and on the other hand the proliferation of that kind of misinformation disinformation or rumors makes it then very difficult it throws up in, increasing barriers to the access of information that people need so looking at both of these together and the the, the pilot countries that we did, we really saw this interplay, which also means that over time, this can really spiral into sort of increasing harm for civilians and really need to be sort of interrupted. Um, and I will say that we, you know, have really appreciated the work that the Global Protection Cluster has done in incorporating this into these frameworks for protection analysis and are, are really, I think, it's a great, we're at a really important moment to where there's growing understanding and growing sort of analysis of this risks incorporated in our sort of collective protection analysis in the humanitarian sector. This is a lot of detail. Um, so as a, as, a, as a part of this work that we've taken in the protection analysis framework that was developed recently um, by IRC and DRC and the Global Protection Cluster and pulled out these information pieces and created a sort of corollary framework for the information protection analytical framework, the IPATH is what we call it. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a few key things. And for those of you familiar with these protection and analysis frameworks, it will be very familiar. So one is context, right? How are we understanding this information ecosystem? The second one is what, what are the threats? Are we understanding these information related threats? Who might be responsible? How are they spreading? I think when it comes to misinformation and disinformation, these questions of why are they spreading? Why are they taking hold? Um, then we come to the, the sort of effect of that threat, that's the, that vulnerability component of the, the protection risk equation, so to speak, um, and looking at who's affected by these, right? I think the, the civic research really talked about some of the ways that different components of the community are being affected differently, and that's a really important thing, and what, what's that impact among those different segments of the community. And then, of course, on the capacity side, are we recognizing existing community capacity to confront these threats? And one thing that I'm just going to sort of point at here is I think um, local media is a really important player in terms of this community capacity. And I say that because I think it's it's often a set of stakeholders that we as humanitarians don't always consider um, in, in our own networks and for our own work. And so I want to just, that's been a really important thing is that there's, I think, a lot of opportunity for increased collaboration between humanitarians and local media as a way to, to sort of work towards protection outcomes. Um, and so then lastly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause so we can sort of have some conversation. Um, the other thing that we've really identified, so in addition to sort of analyzing these threats, we have, have developed a toolkit that has some assessment and monitoring tools to help organizations if they want to do a, a big sort of large analysis or incorporate into some of these ongoing monitoring efforts that are that are, we know are happening. But the other important thing that's that's important to analysis is looking at the, to analyze, excuse me, the results of these information related protection risks also have um, a set of consequences that we see in all of these contexts. And all three of these, I think, came through really clearly in, in the work done on Ukraine. So one as a consequence um, is that it, it creates barriers to accessing public and humanitarian services, right? I think that's a really, that's one that we see in a lot of different contexts 
um, as well. Um, and, and obviously for the humanitarian community is really important as well as looking at those public services that people need to access. The other one that I think is really crucial is the exacerbation of other protection risks, right? So a denial of access to information, we want to look at it as a risk in and of itself, that deliberate deprivation, but also how does it impact other risks that happen? Does it put you at risk of gender-based violence because you don't have access to information about safe routes? Does it put you at risk of exploitation because you're getting false information about uh, services available, right? This sort of whole host of, of further harm that, that can occur. And then the last one is, again, these cycles that we see that these can really lead to the proliferation of even more misinformation and rumors. And so, again, you do get those sort of cycles um, that can can reinforce themselves over time and, and, and over time in crisis. And so that, I think, really speaks to the need to really want to try to interrupt some of those risks um, before they sort of cycle out of control. So I'm going to stop there because I know we're we're getting close to time. Um, and yeah, really excited to hear from others. Thank, thank you, Leah. And we see what Internews uh, has been producing and uh, doing uh, on the topic. So that would take me back to both. I want to go back to Joel and uh, Alex to see what is being done, whether within the ICRC or the uh, Ukrainian society and uh, uh, civil society actors, as well as uh, actor, uh, different uh, uh, NGOs there. So maybe I will give the floor first to Joel and then uh, Alex. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. So uh, from the ICRC perspective, we have developed uh, our own uh, sort of approach, which we're also sharing with a lot of other organizations, and we hope that uh, some point next year we'll be able to even share our internal training on that approach. So the way that we look at uh, the information ecosystem, uh, or at MDH really, um, is that first recognition that in every context, there are foundations for the spread of MDH. And these foundations are the issues that basically drive uh, different grievances and different uh, uh, reasons for violence, for example, or for example, that, that uh, uh, compromise the resilience of people to harmful information. So these foundations are to be analyzed when understanding MDH. Another issue that another uh, um, factor to consider when understanding MDH or in, in a given context um, is the pathways through which we believe it would spread. Um, so already in terms of pre pre being prepared to uh, um, understand MDH or to eventually respond to a specific issue related to it, we need to understand these pathways because we need to know how such uh, a harmful information would eventually spread in a given community or in a context at large. And of course, then the uh, signals. How do we know that there is harmful information spreading? How can we really identify that as a risk? That is the signals we look at. Um, do we see, for example, an escalation in a narrative? Do we see that there's specific wording being used that may uh, uh, amount to incitement of violence? So we look at that as, as a signal of um, the issue existing and spreading and potentially causing harm. That's the first step. And then what we, what we um, our approach is basically to um, detect, assess, and then respond. Um, so first you detect a specific uh, a harmful uh, narrative or a spread of MDH. Then you assess its impact on uh, um, your humanitarian action, obviously, but also on vulnerable population, uh, on, on the civilian population. You think who is it impacting, who is, who is being targeted and why, and what is that narrative achieving in that community? What is it inciting? What kind of behavior? What do you think of all of that? and uh, be able to assess immediate uh, uh, impact and longer term impact um, in order to then inform a response. Because in certain cases, you want to be able to respond very quickly. You want to be able to do um, uh, the, you, you, you want to position yourself in a way that you're already prepared to respond um, and, and be able. And in some other cases, you will decide not to get involved because it's not your mandate or it's not your uh, role to play or or that you may be causing more harm and spreading even further such a narrative or spreading even and amplifying uh, uh, harmful information rather than actually addressing it. One thing I would say that is very important is that two things actually. First, that it's not only an online issue. It is an online offline and as such the response and the ad addressing uh, uh, the phenomena or addressing the problem is an online and offline 
response, often offline, in fact. Um, so we are advocating for a 360 approach, 360 degree approach to this that involves really um, a multidisciplinary response. Sometimes you want to uh, do a classic uh, protection response. Sometimes you want to document harms and you want to have conversations, you want to have dialogue, you want to make an intervention on the law if there is a, if there is a legal issue. Other times you want to work with your network offline network of um, a local um, uh, journalists, network of local influencers, of even your network within the uh, authorities, your contacts, etc. And you want to do your influencing there. And in other times, you might simply want to uh, um, engage in an in an information uh, exercise where you actually put out information that is trustworthy, that is that is factual, that clarifies maybe some of the concerns of people, that answers to their fears, etc. Or partner with other organizations that do so. So that leads me to the second point that in response to NDH, most of your actions are not in the information space. So it is It is not, it's not just because it's an inf a problem in the information space, the response to it or addressing it does not have to be an information campaign or a messaging campaign. But there is a lot of, of course, a lot of uh, uh, importance to that aspect of the response. Um, I'll stop here and then happy to answer more questions. Thank you very much, um, Joel. And obviously, there's a lot uh, to be done uh, uh, in, in, in that uh, domain. Uh, Alex, over to you. Thank you very much. I will briefly talk a little bit more specifically about Ukraine, because I think we've heard a lot about the frameworks. Now, how does all of this look in Ukraine? And in Ukraine, we've seen that there are many narratives that are targeting the perception of how Ukraine conducts itself during this war. And so naturally, we've seen that Ukraine, Ukrainian authorities and civil society are trying to counter strategic narratives that influence how Ukraine is perceived in parts of Africa, parts of Asia, the, the European and American societies. And so some of these information um, or misinformation campaigns um, clearly spoke about the fact that uh, Ukrainian medical services were using infected blood, which lowered the trust in the healthcare system. The, there were misinformation campaigns that the Ukrainian weapon, the delivery of weapons to Ukraine were being redirected to criminal networks, lowering the trust in the Ukrainian armed forces. There were rumors that Ukraine is experimenting on children, further instilling fear in parents who had to decide whether to evacuate their children from dangerous areas or not. And there were rumors that Ukraine is ready to compromise on peace negotiations, something that never happened. And so one thing that we noticed in our research is that there were a lot of efforts by the Ukrainian government and by the Ukrainian civil society to counter these strategic narratives. One thing that we noticed in our research is that on a local level, on a level of a city, a town, a village, or a market, there were notably less efforts to help the population identify the spread of harmful information. And we've seen that the population made wrong decisions, for example, when choosing evacuation routes or made wrong decisions as to when to evacuate. We need to recognize that there are disinformation efforts that are part of a military strategy. And we need to recognize that it is part of the military toolkit available to militaries. But at Civic, the research that we did and what we wanted to demonstrate that there are misinformation narratives that have nothing to do with the fighting, the conduct of military operations, and that have caused excessive or that have caused civilian harm without any justification thereof. And so one thing that we also noticed, and Lauren showed in her presentation, is how the most used social media were the ones that were the least regulated ones. So you may remember that Myanmar was the first big example of how Facebook contributed to what potentially may be called the genocide of the Rohingya. And um, this, 
and so Facebook put a lot, uh, put in place a lot of content moderation and regulation policies, and people used Facebook much less than Telegram, a social media platform that is not regulated at all. Now, the Ukrainian authorities adapted to that reality, and many started their own Telegram channels to inform the population. But the population doesn't necessarily know which Telegram channels are accurate and provide accurate information and which ones are not. And so in our report, you will see a lot of recommendations that are targeted at the Ukrainian government and civil society at large to help with um, giving the population the tools to recognize which information they can trust and which information they cannot. In Ukraine, we have a program where we work directly with affected communities and as part of building up their protection capacity and their ability to stay safe in an environment where they face conflict, we also want to provide them with sessions on um, strategic communication and how to select, filter and identify mis and disinformation. And this is something that we recommend as a whole in our report um, that you will see that all actors that are working directly with affected populations, be it in Ukraine or be it elsewhere, focus on the population themselves, because these are ultimately the ones that suffer directly from the impact of misinformation. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. And it's very important to see the role of the community and how much can be uh, um, done when working with the um, community. I want to thank uh, uh, all of our speakers because this has been really very informative. And uh, if I if I apologize from everyone for going over time, but there are two questions in the chat box. I think it's important that we um, address them. And um, Alex, Lauren, Joel, and Leah, please feel free to um, step in and uh, answer. But I think the first question is for you, Joel. Uh, how is the experience of working with local fact-checking organizations in the operations of the ICRC? Yeah, I'm... I apologize for moving a lot. I had to uh, uh, switch uh, my desk. So I, yeah, I will take the first question. Um, I mean, it's not it's not like uh, a specific experience that is different from other, um, for example, local organizations or or uh, media organizations. I would say it really changes from one context to another. In some cases, we would maybe reach out for uh, engaging on some trainings. In others, we would actually provide some trainings. Uh, or potentially even uh, partner with them uh, in in very localized manner, uh, but it's not systematic for the ICRC to reach out to fact checking organizations. Um, and uh, we do our own verification mostly, but in some cases there might be, depending on the relationship with that organization, the organization, there might be some triangulation that that could be done um, in that space. I would also maybe here underline a bit also the internal capacity that we have been building for the past few years. It has been very slowly increasing, uh, but at least increasing uh, on uh, open source information verification and open source information um, uh, analysis. So, and that is a need that I think is growing for all humanitarian organizations really, no matter, uh, no matter their mandate, no matter their size as well. Um, I hope that answers. Thank you very much, um, Joel. Um, and of course, Masoud, if you uh, have more to say about this, please uh, feel free to post uh, in the uh, chat box. The second question was about artificial intelligence. And if there is anything to, um, sorry, let me find it. Is there a tool or automation or, or the usage of uh, AI to analyze and triangulate or information, or is it simply uh, manual work. So maybe Lauren uh, and Alex, you can tell us about uh, Ukraine specifically, how it was done, and if there is anything that has to do with artificial intelligence there. Uh, I th think I should distinguish between civics research and what other actors are doing in Ukraine. There, um, there are efforts to monitor disinformation using AI um, within the uh, different uh, different government initiatives and civil society initiatives for civics research. We did not use AI 
to analyze this information. Um, we used, uh, when we looked at Telegram in particular, we chose specific locations and time periods where we thought um, there might be higher risk to civilians and looked at um, known Russian and Russian affiliated um, accounts, uh, accounts with a pattern of, of continuing to propagate uh, Russian narratives uh, pretty closely and looked at what information was being shared on those and it spread. So it was done manually using um, an analysis tool. Can I just add something? I mean, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on the technology side, and but it's been a topic that there's a lot of internal discussion at Internews about, certainly. I think what I would say, which is not a direct answer to the question, but really that analysis piece, I think it's it's just so important like that because we're talking about qualitative analysis because we're looking at analysis in really particular localized contexts i think um it's like uh, that really needs to be done by by humans i think much of it really needs to be done by humans but i would would also say that you know while there are a lot of conversations about these tools i think making sure that we really are are continuing to ground that analysis in in those frameworks but also contextually so again what we find is doing that analysis with civil society groups with often very hyper local grassroots organizations is really the best way to to truly understand those aspects and so while well, I, I don't want to say that there aren't any opportunities for sort of um technological tools to help us do that i think that that for me is the is the really important piece Thank you very much. Um, so Armel had a question about uh, the experience of uh, uh, countering rumors and disinformation in a context where the government itself is less engaged. I think maybe all of you could, uh, could answer uh, to this uh, question, um, Lauren or uh, Leah, about maybe different contexts where the uh, governments are less engaged. I mean, I think it's a big piece of the, oh, sorry, Lauren, go ahead. No, Leah, please. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think it's a big, it's a, it's a really crucial piece of that analysis, right? And that analysis of that information ecosystem, and then specifically understanding its relation to protection, because, and I think there's actually an additional question that sort of gets at this question as well, understanding the relationship, for example, of media outlets to authorities is going to be really crucial. So starting with an understanding of what, um, what the sort of legal and policy background is, but then also what the more informal, you know, behavior of conflict parties towards individuals, civilians, media outlets around information is really important because developing those strategies and, and Joelle sort of talked about those set of strategies needs to be done um, really carefully. So, I mean, I don't have, have easy answers, but I think, you know, starting with really a nuanced and deep understanding of what those risks are to make sure that, you know, we want to, understand the protection risks related to this information, but not put people at further risk um, through those activities. So it's it's really not easy and, and needs very careful sort of risk benefit analysis at every stage. And of course, working with communities, right? Understanding from community perspectives, where do they see um, their potential risks and not? Because sometimes we have different ideas about that, right? So we might come in and say, well, online activity is dangerous because blah, blah, blah. And actually there are ways that for some people in the community that is safer than in-person engagement. So I think that community engagement um, for analysis pieces is gonna be really the important part there. Yes, Alex, please go ahead. I will come in because I think it also relates to um, Yolanda's question afterwards in countries where governments are the main perpetrator of misinformation and disinformation, it is more important to build up civil society and the community's capacity to deal with the spread of misinformation and disinformation. For example, in Sudan this year, we have seen how communities and neighborhoods organize themselves to pass safe information and correct information about where they could get supplies, where they could get medical care, where they could move to be safe. And it happened quite organically. And I think looking at the environment in which that happened would help us understand which tools we need to provide to communities 
and which tools we need to provide to actors working directly with communities to make sure that they can react to those. So in short, the answer is, if it's a government that is the main perpetrator in that sense, then building out the capacity of the community becomes more important and demanding from actors who work on community-based protection activities that this is part of their portfolio, whether you're a donor or whether you're an actor or a benefactor is a strong, strong recommendation that we can make at this stage. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. And uh, thank you for also addressing Yolande's uh, question. Uh, Lauren, do you want to add anything before we close? Uh, my my initial reaction and response was going to be very similar to uh, to what Leah and, and Alex um, emphasized, uh, the role of civil society, um, looking at other protection actors uh, and actors in the information ecosystem who can, uh, who have capacity and influence. Um, and you see this, you know, uh, Alex gave the example of Sudan, you could also look at South Sudan, where the media environment and the civil society environment is extremely restricted. Um, and and the capacity of, of a lot of actors is limited, but you still see civil society stepping up to try to look at some of these dynamics, um, to look at uh, mis and disinformation and um, and uh, and support civilians to access uh, safe and and uh, and accurate information. Um, and in and, and some of those settings, there's also, you know, well, there are many other protection actors, the Global Protection Cluster, uh, folks like Internews, um, but there's also sometimes as well peacekeeping missions mandated to look at uh, mis and disinformation, the protection implications and respond to it. So there are sometimes other uh, other actors at the um, at the international level who can can play a role in uh in identifying and also supporting those civil society at the community level who are trying to do that work thank you very much uh lauren and um thank you for all our speakers i think this was very useful and uh, informative and uh, indeed very very uh concerning examples from uh, ukraine uh, but i'm sure um our um, participants today could identify with some of um, those uh, examples from their own uh, context. I know there might be uh, other questions. Uh, hopefully, we will have other opportunities to um, answer them. But uh, some uh, very initial um, observations. I would like to stress the, the, the part that uh, Alex concluded uh, with on the role of community and the role of uh, uh, civil society. And there's a lot to be done there to engage the different actors. And as Masood mentioned in the, in the chat, benefit from the different capacities that are uh, out there. <laughs> there's also some room for exploration in the AI uh, um, uh, domain and uh, and uh, the, 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 the technology um, around it. So I hope there will be some uh, linkages between the different actors after the webinar to do that. And uh, one final thing is just a recommendation also to our speakers on all these amazing and um, protection oriented tools, how to make them more and more accessible to people in the field, to people working across uh, the globe. I think today with the civic um, 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 research, we have seen how much powerful it is to know about uh, things that are happening and how much we can benefit. So it would be uh, great to, uh, to, to make it accessible and allow for even further cross-learning. And I think we commit in the advocacy working group of the Global Protection Cluster to uh, help facilitate with that. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you to our speakers. Bye. Have a good evening. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.